Good afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to have Andrew Small with me, who is a well-known uh, expert in all things China and beyond. Uh, Andrew is an author of a, a very important book on the, uh, the contemporary Chinese uh, politics, economy, and culture. And uh, he's author of several uh, other publications. Uh, he has a great understanding of both where the West and the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, destinies uh, are moving towards. And uh, that is uh, the reason uh, we have Andrew with us to today, particularly in regard to the evolving situation in Afghanistan and how, uh, you know, the U.S. exit uh, has uh, opened up a, a series of possibilities as well as uh, perils and dangers in the coming uh, months and years. Uh, so welcome, Andrew. Thank you for your time. I know you are far away, uh, but I really appreciate uh, you joining us because uh, uh, this is a question that uh, I guess everybody's uh, interested these days. What happens in Afghanistan uh, after the US leaves and how far is China going to fill in that vacuum in the region and by default in the country too? So your initial thoughts on Afghanistan crises, if we may call it, and uh, the uh, potential or, or future role of China in stabilizing uh, a country that is on the brink of a civil war once again. Well, thanks very much, uh, Razan. Delighted to be able to, to join you and, and thanks for the very kind introduction. Um, yes, a very pertinent topic at, at the moment. Um, the, I think, the question of what China will do, you can you can look at across um, several different dimensions. Um, and I think it's maybe worth starting off with with what is it that China actually wants um, in in the coming period? Because I think we've had a long phase with China and Afghanistan where, in a certain sense, China didn't want the Taliban to win and it didn't want the US to win. And in one way, the stalemate suited them. Um, and they've been waiting anxiously um, for, for the US withdrawal. They, they only wanted to see the US draw down in circumstances in which some kind of a political deal was reached. So they've been apprehensive about this outcome. They didn't really want to see the Taliban win outright on the battlefield. They knew that as of, months ago and, and, and really in the last couple of years, they knew they'd be emerging as the largest, the most dominant political force in the country, but they hoped in various ways they'd be sort of hemmed in by political compromises that they had to make with other forces in, in, in the country. Um, so this is an, not exactly the outcome they were, uh, they, they, they were hoping for. I think they think that an emboldened Taliban is less likely to make compromises on, on, on the issues they want them to make compromises on um, and is likely to have a similarly emboldening effect for other militants across the region and, and China's in that sense particularly concerned about what the ramifications might be in Pakistan and to a lesser extent Central Asia. Um, so at the same time, they're also very wary of too deep a level of involvement. The psychology around this is all around graveyard of empires, risks, security threats, all of these sorts of things. Um, and so I think the sense is economically, politically, and certainly militarily, there has to be a degree of caution on, on China's part. Um, they, they don't want to position themselves as, as too dominant an actor. They know there are certain roles militarily that they, they, they couldn't take on that wouldn't serve their interests uh, anyway, but even economically, I, I think they, they still see some risks in pushing ahead with some of the very large scale investments that, that people are, are talking about. I think these are things they would expect to tread fairly cautiously on. And, and right now, I, I think there's just some very short term objectives. I, I think they want to see a government emerge in Afghanistan um, that has at least the sort of fig leaf of international legitimacy. They don't want a repeat of having a situation in which they have a sort of prior state on their border operating under international sanction. Um, and there are some specific things that they want from the Taliban and they're using this window now, I think, to lean a little harder, whether directly or with the help of the Pakistanis, particularly on the transnational terrorist groups that they're most 
concerned about, which are essentially uh, the Turkestan Islamic Party, or the Chinese continue to call it ETIM, even if the group doesn't call itself that, um, and to a, a certain extent as well, uh, the TTP um, and, and, and what the Afghan Taliban's relationship with them might look like. Where, whether you end up with serious investments in Afghanistan, there are obviously investments on a fair scale in Pakistan. Um, and I think China is more concerned about what the situation in Afghanistan is likely to do for, um, uh, I mean, the cross-border risks are obviously minimal given the, the Wakhan corridor is essentially impossible. Uh, but if, it's, uh, if it comes to targeting Chinese workers um, on CPEC projects or things like that, that's already been a concern, I think, the situation's got actually worse in that regard in, in, the, in recent months, particularly with the attack in Dasu. So they're, they're worried about that already. And I think they're more concerned um, as well about what sort of context there's, there's going, going to be for that. Um, so, I mean, that, that's the kind of immediate picture, I think, in terms of how, how China's looking at this. They know they have to be more diplomatically active than I think they would even like to. They prefer to kind of duck a little bit, have keep their heads down on, on this. I, I think that, that they're still concerned again when, when they start stepping out too actively, they know it's easy to make enemies and, and get on the wrong side of things. They like being seen to be relatively neutral in an Afghan context where they can get away with it. Um, so, so I think nonetheless, they know that uh, they have to step up uh, more actively uh, now if they're going to nudge things in the direction that they uh, want on some of these different issues. Um, and they're happy, of course, to kind of play along with some of these narratives about how good it is for them and how bad it is um, for, for the United States. The realities of the situation don't necessarily um, counteract that, particularly on, on, on the US side. But um, I think there's just a lot of trepidation on their part about what um, what this is actually going to amount to and how much they can reasonably expect um, to, to be able to influence the outcomes. Yeah, so yeah, Andrew, that's, that's pretty comprehensive. And I think uh, I certainly tend to agree with you, but, uh, uh, but you know, they do, uh, the, the Chinese do have an interest in the natural resources, you know, the minerals. I mean, that's what one reads about the, you know, the $1 trillion worth. Uh, minerals uh, buried in Afghanistan, untapped, unexplored. And also they have an interest in, uh, you know, Central Asian energy sources, given that China is an economy that requires lots of natural resources. So would you not think that they would be uh, playing a more direct role once the, the, the things settle down a bit more? I mean, you know, uh, because we do know that they are, you know, they're okay in working with the Taliban. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, it depends what settle down a bit more means. I think that's the, the, the question for them. Um, settle down a bit more uh, can mean Taliban is able to establish some form of effective control, but then I think we'll have a, the, the Chinese are going to wait to see things like, you know, is this a political constellation that's going to hold? Or are they going to go through another sequence where they push ahead with some large scale investment that's not going to yield returns for another six to 10 years? And then they find that the thing is turned on its head again after, after a few years. They'll want to see what the security conditions look like as well. Even if there is roughly effective control maintained, they've been operating in, in, um, in, in countries where there's far more effective control, but where their people are uh, at risk. And, um, and there's more anxiety, uh, I think, about that. There's, I think, more caution about some of the riskier uh, investments, if anything, in the last few years than, than, than there has been. Um, and this question of how the Taliban deal, particularly with the TIP, they, don't, they want to dangle the possibility of investments for the Taliban, but I, I, I think they still want to they, they want to be able to incentivize them to uh, play along on on the issues that that, that they care about. I, I think there are things that they that they want. And I mean, if you then look at the specific investments, obviously they still have the INAC copper mine, um, which has been mothballed. Um, uh, not, nothing has been has been moving ahead there. It would be in principle one of the, the 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 investments that could sort of spring back into life. But if you listen to what the company is saying on this, they're very cautious as well. They they had an awful time with the entire experience. Um, they'll proceed very cautiously again in terms of questions around the economic viability um, of the thing. The Amudaria oil investments were never particularly significant in scale, so aren't so uh, important. I think the newer things that are of interest to things like lithium um, 
in the uh, in the uh, west and, 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 and south um, of, of the country. So I mean, the, the, there are areas which, if the right conditions are in place, which which would be um, a qualitatively good political relationship is established, there is a level of security that is provided in the country that, that seems to stick. Um, and the economic conditions that make it viable to press ahead with some of these things, because again, I mean, if you look at some of the assessments that are being done on the Chinese side, they want to make sure that there are the, there are the right kind of skilled personnel in place to be able to do these things. They there's um, the, the 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 surrounding economic conditions have to be right. There's, there's a whole series of different factors that are, are coming into play. So I think they know that these resources are there, that there'd be great benefits to to be had from them, but they also see that this can be a bit of an illusion. Uh, the the resources right. have been under the ground for some time, and no one's been able to get them out and make money from them on 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 scale. So I, I think they're I, I think they're more cautious again about this than they than they were when they first pushed ahead with the um, with, with the INAC investment. Yes. So, I mean, uh, which also leads me uh, to the other, uh, you know, big theory. I mean, of course, it's one of the many theories now that things are rapidly changing, uh, which is the, the Sino-Russian axis, quote unquote, you know, which is now emerging in a lot of literature and a lot of, you know, uh, the expert sort of opinion or, or uh, projection. So, I mean, what uh, is that, number one, is that a real thing? The Russians and the Chinese sort of ganging up against the, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the US dominance, historical dominance uh, through the 20th century. And are they, and, and using Central Asia and Afghanistan and, you know, and, and by extension Pakistan too, in terms of countering some of that influence, or is that too uh, alarmist? I mean, you know, there are alarmist uh, uh, projections as well, as you know, you know, so one has to really uh, sift a lot of material on, uh, in what one hears and reads, you know. I mean, I, I think there's 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 a couple of different angles to it. One one is in Afghanistan itself. One is what's been going on in the wider region, and then there's just the Sino-Russian relationship uh, more generally. I think in Afghanistan, the two have had a slightly different view. Um, it is a place where Russia sort of stepped in a bit more actively in in the last few years, building its own relations with the Taliban. China, of course, had a long-standing relationship with the Taliban going back to the last time they were in in government. But I think China was a little bit concerned that the Russian role was a bit more of a spoiler one, that it was Russia positioning itself in Afghanistan as another front to open with the US. Whereas in fact, I think China, it's one of the very rare cases in which China saw its interests as being relatively consistent with, with the US and the two had actually coordinated relatively closely. But I, I think with the US out and we're seeing this even uh, in, in, in recent weeks, I think the two are a little bit more joined up on Afghanistan now. I, I, I kind of expect some degree of uh, kind of consistency in issues like diplomatic recognition, um, how they're handling some of the Central Asian dimensions on this. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that we saw Russian exercises with Tajikistan and Chinese exercises with Tajikistan um, sort of hot on each other's heels. Um, I, I think when it comes to some of the concerns that China has about border security in Central Asia, where which does matter more than the, the direct um, uh, kind of China-Afghanistan border, I think that's something where the two sides have been coordinating closely. Um, and I think, I mean, China played a helpful role in in the Russia-Pakistan relationship. Um, I think there's no question about that. I, I think there is a kind of um, and I mean, put in the in the wider context of, of of what's going on, the two sides relationship has got a lot closer than a lot of analysts had expected before the Crimea annexation. I mean, I think we've seen these steps forward in terms of military cooperation. Um, uh, the energy linkages, um, but but a whole series of, of of things that people had previously said there's still too much mistrust between between the two sides, um, and, and I think circumstances have just pushed the two much closer together. And you are seeing areas like this where um, there is just more of a kind of a, a sense that the two should figure out some interests in common. And, and and I think in the aftermath 
kind of scenario in, in Afghanistan, probably more so than um, during the kind of final year of the US presence, uh, or rather the final few years in, in, in the peace process. I, I think the two sides are, are, are not so um, uh, far apart in the way that they're looking at it. But I think the Chinese role is probably a more, is actually a, a little bit more active. I mean, the Russia-Pakistan relationship of course, is is nothing comparable to the China-Pakistan uh, relationship. And I think a lot of what China does in particular, but in some ways both sides in relations with the Taliban, a lot of it's still mediated through through Pakistan, of, of course. Of course, and, uh, of course and, yes. And that's, that's not going to change. And that gives China kind of a, 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 a different kind of influence and set of ins and, and trust on the Pakistani side, of course, that the Russians don't have that's still a much more newer and more tentative relationship. But I mean, the the wider objectives are exactly, as you said, I think it's alarmist to say that um, you know, China and Russia see themselves um, pushing back against in a sort of ideologically hostile way to the, uh, against the West and see some common cause in, 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 in a whole series of different dimensions of, of, of that. I think, I think both sides are pretty explicit about the fact that that's what they're doing. Yeah, but also, I mean, you know, Andrew, I, I just said that because, I'm, uh, you know, uh, the reality is that the Cold War mindset still, I mean, it's so ingrained in uh, uh, in the Washington's policy circles, as well as, uh, you know, the conventional sort of uh, establishment uh, that, uh, that kind of looks at the world still with that lens. I mean, the Cold War has been over for 40 years. I mean, it's, it's been more than 40 years that Soviet Union collapsed, I mean, you know, and we saw glimpses of that in, in the Ru Russia Gate, so-called Russia Gate, where all sorts of allegations were hurled in uh, President Trump being elected to Russian support, etc. Yes, I mean, they may, have, they may have an interest and they may have abetted some of those uh, social media, uh, you know, disinformation campaigns, but to say that there was a all out conspiracy against the US to do that. But, you know, a lot of people live in that mindset. So now that China, I mean, if you read a lot of material, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about you because you write more nuance. But if you read a lot, a lot of material on the on, on on China, I mean, you know, articles and, and, and papers and on Twitter, I mean, there's this constant uh, uh, drumming up of the China threat. And yes, it is perhaps for a for a sole superpower. It is it is it is a, a a threat to see another power emerging. But you know, this power to understand this power, one needs a different uh, set of tools and different uh, set of analytical uh, sort of lenses, I would say, uh, to understand what China is all about and what China is actually aiming for. And, uh, and it's not certainly the 20th century conventional military combat, uh, you know, or limited to that. I mean, it's far more complex and deeper. And, you know, I don't know if you agree with me on that one. Or Sure. I mean, I, 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 I think what, what has at the same time gone on, though, is that I think particularly under Xi Jinping, um, uh, people, even the kind of a lot of the friends of China and, and, and people who had really wanted to develop uh, a much more cooperative relationship and um, people who were who, who could even figure out a way that the Chinese Communist Party was um, you know, a, a a problematic but still kind of acceptable partner on all sorts of things. And and there was, you know, there are plenty of people in the Chinese system who, yes, they were party uh, members and in, 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 in there were all sorts of um, uh, problematic uh, uh, developments going on in, in, in China, but there were still ways of, of figuring out compromises and dealing with each other on, on um, a whole series of issues. It has become much, much harder. Um, uh, and I, I think that's not just coming out of Washington. I'm, I'm where I'm sitting at the moment in, in, in Europe. Um, I, I, I think you've, you've seen a, a, a lot of the kind of, the people who've been closest to, to, to China really uh, seeing the evolution of the domestic ideological environment under Xi Jinping, the more hostile approach that's being taken um, in the neighborhood, whether militarily, uh, politically, uh, economically, a lot more of an instrumentalization um, of um, uh, economics to um, 
uh, politics and, and, and security than was the case before. I mean, I think if you go around and trace what's gone on in DC, what's gone on in Europe, what's gone on in Australia, what's gone on in, um, you know, look in the neighborhood as well, look at opinion polls in Korea, in, um, uh, you know, not of course, uh, I mean, of course, Japan is all, all already where, where it is. Look at what's gone on in a certain way on, on, on Sino-Indian relations, including, um, uh, you know, I, I think steps taken there on, on, on the Chinese side that have cut against agreements that were, you know, had, had been a, a real fixture of the relationship for, for a long time. I think there's too much going on on too many fronts uh, to be able to attribute it purely to um, uh, developments in, in, in the kind of DC demonization approach. And, and, and there is certainly a strand of thinking that, that lacks a lot of nuance there and is, is, is not trying to discern really what's going on. And, and I mean, I, there are still these issues. And I mean, I, I, I still, on, on an issue like Afghanistan, I, I, I don't think these all have to be subsumed into a Cold War confrontation. I, I, I think this has actually uh, been, been an issue. And I, I still think even now there are areas in which the two sides are not inherently, um, do not have inherently antithetical objectives on, on things like, like that. But I think we just are in a different phase of the relationship with, with China. And a lot of the developments there have been, um, uh, have, have come about as a result of the very different way in which Xi Jinping is approaching the world and is approaching um, internal developments in, in, in China as well. And I, I think there are a lot of people who have very reluctantly had to face up to the fact that they're not going to be able to have the kind of relationship with China that they'd, they, they'd really hoped, and in many cases spent decades of their life trying to, to, to build. This takes me to the final uh, question that I want to uh, talk to you moving forward. Uh, which is the rise, I mean, the, the rise or the re resurgence of ISIS uh, in the wake of Taliban takeover. And we have seen that uh, horrific uh, blast at Kabul airport, leaving uh, hundreds dead and injured. Uh, and, uh, you know, the US sort of retaliation, first through a drone strike, and now, I mean, I, this is most, uh, uh, you know, uh, observers agree this is going to increase and escalate and, and that the Taliban might might even uh, be attacked by, by these forces. So going forward, do you see any chance of a collaboration or uh, some, some level of cooperation between China, the US and Russia? Because I mean, they all share the same concern here. I mean, you, you did allude to it in the earlier uh, part of our discussion, but I mean, I would like you to sort of uh, elaborate a bit more. I mean, I, short term, the, the, the is a form of implicit cooperation um, already, because I, I think the different sides are in different ways, leaning on the Taliban through different channels um, to, um, to come up with a government that um, is, uh, I mean, I, I that at least looks inclusive, but I, I think even on the Chinese and the Russian side, I, I think there is still a view that something that you need something that's going to hold together over time. Um, so I, I, I think the purely fig leaf version is, is still not necessarily going to be something that they they, they view as as as, as comfortably, um, uh, but. I mean, the power realities are what they are, and they're, they're obviously, um, but, but some of those power realities as well relate to the fact that if you have a country operating under um, uh, US Treasury sanctions, um, then it's going to be very hard for them to, and with aid frozen and with their entire finances frozen, um, that, that's going to be a difficult situation to deal with in, in, in the neighborhood as well uh, for them. And again, the more immediate effects will actually be felt by China and its uh, friends in the region than by, um, than by the United States or, 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 or others. Um, so I, I think there is this question in the short term of um, this, how, how do you ensure that you have a government that emerges that um, is at least able to pass a sort of acceptability test internally and externally in, in, in some minimal sense of, of, of what that amounts to, um, knowing you know, where we are in terms of the internal political dynamics and being realistic about what that might um, actually mean. So I think there is that immediate issue. 
Um, the, the medium term issue and the harder one to discern is two sides on, I mean, there, there is a sort of, uh, the, the, the two sides for some time have been cooperating or coordinating a little bit on the, the sort of uh, longer term situation, political constellations in, in Afghanistan. But I think you're going to come back to a counterterrorism question on, on, on this as well, because that's going to be the main US focus um, in, in the country. And you have this peculiar dovetailing, in a sense, between China and the United States on, on this, because um, although the US has gone through and delisted ETIM, um, uh, in 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 the in the previous in the final year of the Trump administration, in practice you have various individuals who are um, actually on the U.S. list. I mean, they're on Al Qaeda lists. Um, you you have individuals um, uh, who are um, you know who, who China would list as ETM individuals, but um, simply have kind of crossover with U.S. targeting uh, lists. And um, this is why you had drone strikes killing. Um, Uyghur militants in North Waziristan, conventional military strikes in Badakhshan, elsewhere. Um, this is something where, in fact, there, there is a sort of shared short crossover of an enemy's list. And that's not an area of counterterrorism where the two sides can meaningfully cooperate and coordinate, um, given all of the repressive behavior that uh, we, we see from China in, 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 in Xinjiang that has, of course, made it very difficult even to talk about these, these um, uh, issues in, in, in the same way. I mean, that had, of course, an effect on, on, on the delisting in, in, in a certain sense. But nonetheless, again, the two sides do have um, groups that are of mutual concern. And I do think it's still going to be an area in which they will maintain channels, Russians um, in, in, are in the same boat on, on, on some of this as, as well. I only point out the Chinese kind of specific case here because I, I think people aren't always aware of the fact that some of this has gone on over, um, over recent years, but it will continue to be the case that if you go down the, a, a list that includes um, ISIS, um, TTP, um, uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, the, the, there, are, there are going to be groups that, 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 that both sides um, and, and, and all three uh, treat as, to varying degrees, uh, matters of, of common concern. So uh, I, whether that translates into a huge amount beyond the fact that they will continue to be able to agree to sanction specific individuals, um, but also that in some cases that you know, the, the, there will be a differential degree to which China is willing to turn a blind eye to the fact that you're still, you may still be getting, for instance, uh, US drone strikes. And I mean, there's, there's still going to be the question of what for non conventional kind of means are used, even after the, the, the military itself has, has pulled out. And that was something that China was not uncomfortable with in, in, in the last few years because they didn't have means to hit these um, in individuals. So you have kind of some of these dark zones on, on this that I, I, I think in, in the future, you, you may still find the two sides see eye to eye, whether it translates into something that's cooperative. But I, I think the immediate politics of it mean, and the, the Chinese role um, uh, in, in, in all of this uh, means that it, it will be a channel that the two sides keep open. The striking thing is in the middle of the worst period in US-China relations, Afghanistan was one of the only areas in which the two sides kind of maintained some level of um, open communication. And, and you had uh, Khalil Zad going through Beijing to a degree that um, some US allies were concerned that he was keener to go there than even to, to, to drop in on them. But it's a reflection of the fact that China occupies a particular role in this will continue to, and will continue to be reasons for the two sides to uh, talk to each other, um, uh, e e notwithstanding all the mistrust and all of the rivalrous dimensions to the relationship that there are in most other contexts. Great, Andrew. This has been such a such an informative and insightful discussion and thank God for the nuance, you know, <laughs> that is what I'm really hoping that uh, people who would watch this, uh, this uh, interview or read its transcript uh, would learn from you and also uh, get a sort of overall sense on where things are headed. I hope, I do hope that you join us once again in a couple of weeks where we uh, look a bit inward within China.
and uh, the One Belt and the Road Initiative, and and uh, you know particularly the role of Pakistan and the uh, other regional actors in Central Asia and Southern Asia. And let's uh, get back uh, once we can, once you have a bit of time. But in the meantime, thank you so much for joining me and goodbye. Thank, thanks a lot, Raza. Delighted to be here.